Why are some white foals perfectly healthy while others are born doomed to die within the first 48 hours of life? If you've heard of lethal white foal syndrome, you probably know their tragic fate. But maybe not why it happens. There are plenty of white horses out there living normal lives, even competing at the highest level. So what make these particular foals so different? In this video, I dug into the latest research and genetic papers to explain what really happens when a lethal white foal is born, and what that means for breeders trying to do the right thing. To really understand why these foals don't survive, we need to go back to where the problem begins, at the genetic level. Because this isn't just about color. The same gene that creates that white coat is also responsible for something else. Something that, in the wrong combination, proves fatal. Before we can talk about more about what goes wrong, we need to talk about what normally happens. Where does color even come from in a horse's body? Well, horses only make pigment in specialized cells called melanocyte. These cells have the right tools, or organelles if we want to be technical, to produce the actual pigment. So anywhere you see color on a horse, that means the melanocyte are present and doing their job. But a lot of genes can interfere in how these melanocytes reproduce, how they make pigment, and even how they get distributed in the body. If because of a mistake, a gene doesn't give the right instruction, you could end up with a patch that has no melanocyte, no pigment at all. We can group these kind of mistakes in two categories. First, some areas don't get any melanocyte. When that's the case, the skin will remain pink instead of being dark, and the hair that will grow on it will be white. That's what gives us markings like uh, stars and blaze and socks, and also some of the white coat pattern like Sabino. All these patterns happen because some gene prevented the melanocyte from fully spreading across the body during development, leaving some pigment-free zones. The second reason is when melanocytes are present, but they're not able to make pigment, or they're not able to make pigment anymore. You've probably seen this happen after an injury. Sometimes the hair grows back white on that spot. Well, that's because the melanocyte in that area were damaged and stopped producing pigment. And when that loss of pigment happens gradually, all over the body, that's how a gray horse turns lighter and lighter over time, eventually becoming completely white. I go into more detail about this whole process, about uh, how horses turn gray and then white in this video over here. There's also genes that simply prevent the melanocyte from making like a full range of pigment, so you end up with some washed out colors. So now that we know what melanocytes do and what happens when they don't do their job, the next question is, where do these cells actually come from? I talk about migration of melanocyte, but from where? Where are they originally from? How do they move? Just like any other specialized cells in the body, think of skin cells or heart cells or the one that lines the intestine, the melanocytes start out the same. They are undifferentiated cells at the very early stage of the embryo. At first, none of these cells have a defined job. But as the embryo grows, they begin to specialize and move to their proper places throughout the body. In the case of the melanocyte, their story starts incredibly early, at a stage called the gastrula stage. That's one of the first steps in the embryo development, right when the neural tube is beginning to form. It's very early on. In humans, this happens around the third week of gestation, and in horses even earlier, roughly around day 16. At this stage, a cluster of cells sits in what is called the neural crest of the embryo. But they don't stay there for very long. Soon, they start receiving signal from a specific gene in their DNA that tells them that it's time to change, to transform, and to move on. From the neural crest, these cells begin their journey, migrating in all parts of the body where they will later on will take on their specialized role, including, of course, becoming melanocyte. So this process called neural cell differentiation, or sorry, I should say neural crest differentiation, is a crucial step in turning that simple little clusters of cell that we all start with and turning it into a, a foal or a little pig or a baby. One thing you have to keep in mind is how an embryo develops is a whole cascade of genes, each of them coding for protein of one type or another that end up interacting with each other. And here's where things really get interesting, because in that same tiny region of the embryo, the neural crest, lie the cells that will one day determine both a horse's color and something far more vital to its survival. Inside the neural crest are cells known as melanoblasts, precursor cells that haven't yet decided what they're going to become. 
From there, they will branch into two main families, each of them with a very different job. Some of them will turn into the melanocyte, the pigment-carrying, producing cells that we've talked about. These travel along what's called a dorsal lateral pathway, meaning they move along the developing back of the embryo and they will spread outward in what will become the skin and the hair, basically the surface of the fold. But the other will take a completely different route. These are the melanoblast glial cells, and instead of heading toward the skin, they migrate ventrally down into the belly of the embryo. There, they transform into nerve cells that connect the intestine to the rest of the nervous system. Both of these cells line, the one that gives the color and the one that gives motion to the gut, are controlled by many of the same genetic signal. And one gene in particular plays a central role in both cell types, the EDNRB, or the endothelin B receptor gene. This gene codes for a protein and its receptor in the cell wall that allows it to respond to the various signal or trigger that are essential to transforming and relocating the cells where they need to be in the embryo. So these receptor, this, is, this protein and this receptor cells are basically vital for them to get the signal to move. And, well, there exists a mutation. You knew this was coming, right? On this very gene that transposes two base pair, and that leads to one amino acid in a chain of over 400 of them to be changed from one form to the other. In this case, if you want to know, it's from isoleucine to lysine. That little mistake changes everything. The properties of the whole protein is different enough with those change to make it almost completely ineffective. The domino effect is that the migration of the melanoblasts and their transformation into melanocyte and melanocyte glial cell is completely disrupted. As a result, the pigment-making melanoblasts don't form. They don't end up in the skin layer, and therefore the foal is unable to make pigment, and that's why it's all white. And because the melanoblast glial cells do not migrate down into the gut, it causes what's called agangliolitis, meaning no ganglia, meaning without nerve connection. That's another way of saying it. Without any innervation to the intestine, the foal is unable to move the material out of its intestine. They eventually distend, rupture, and the foal goes into septic shock and dies within 24 to 48 hours from birth. There is no cure. There is no treatment. The back end of the intestinal tract is just completely inert. To prevent any suffering, the foal is usually euthanized way earlier before they suffer from terrible colics. Thankfully, mammals have spare genetic copies of everything, right? We get one set from our father and one set from a mother. Same thing for, for the horses. So we have pretty much two of everything. So as long as the foal has at least one normal copy of the EDNRB gene, there is no problem with the ganglia formation, and it's born perfectly healthy. The melanocyte glial cells end up where they're supposed to go, and um, everything is fine. But with one functional copy of the gene, a funny thing happens with the distribution of other kind of melanocyte, the pigment melanocyte. They don't distribute evenly. It's like when there's only one good copy of the gene, it flickers, making sometime good protein and sometime not, and therefore the distribution is not perfect. And where it's present, of course, um, it causes the skin to sometime have some coloration because there's melanocyte. In other part, there is no melanocyte and the skin is white. And the result of all that flickering and sometime being on and off means that you end up with what we call the frame overall pattern of coloration. If you were looking to produce this pattern in your horses, you would have to have at least one parent with this mutation so that you can have this genetic outcome where 50% of the foal will inherit the frame overall gene, the EDRNB mutated gene, and they will show that disrupted pattern of pigmentation, while the other 50% that don't get the mutation would be just normally pigmented or as they are called, solid. If you were to breed two animals that each had a copy of the mutated gene, you would end up with the same chance of getting a pattern full, 50%, but 25% of the time, you would end up with a homozygous full for that mutation. And well, if they have two copies of the mutated gene, they don't have a backup. They are the white foals that are destined to die, the lethal white foals. 
By the way, don't think I just knew all this from just being around horses. I read papers and science articles explaining all this. And if you'd like to know more, you can grab all these references that I use on my Patreon site. Patreon is how I get support from people like you that want to see me continue to make horse and science video in the future and hopefully maybe be able to tackle bigger and more complex subjects. Although this one was already pretty complex, it took me hours to understand it well enough to explain it back to you. I do want to take this moment to really thank my Patreon member that support me at the full, yearling, and boss mayor level. Thank you so much. As well as those of you that has chosen to support the channel via the YouTube membership. Thank you also. So anyway, if you would like to join them and help support the channel, you can certainly check out the Patreon page. The link is here. It's also down in the description. I post update regularly on what I'm working on, what the challenges are, what I'm excited about, and also some extra information that I might not have been able to squeeze into the final video that you're seeing now. Anyway, back to the case of the lethal white folds. Interestingly, even when they cross two overalls, either by intent or by mistake, together, they don't statistically see 25% of white folds that they should see. And that tells the geneticists studying this particular gene that some simply die in utero before they get much further along than a couple weeks, which is probably the better outcome, frankly. By the way, this is gene mutation that is also found in humans. In this case, it causes a disease called Hirschsprung disease. It's also found in mice and in rats, and yes, it has exactly the same effect on their guts. The variability of this gene is what makes it sometimes hard to fully understand. Geneticists refer to this as imperfect penetration of the gene, and it's also why not all frame overalls look like this. Some look like this, and others look like that. There is a great variation in the expression of this mutation. But now we understand that breeding two animals with a mutated gene is very dangerous. But we can also understand also that it can be hard to tell for sure if an animal has the gene just by looking at them. For example, this stallion is a frame overall. Would you have guessed that? Sometime breeders will cross an overall with a Tobiano. Tobiano is a different gene. It also creates patchy pattern of white and color, but it's not lethal in any of its form. And they will do that in order to increase their chance of getting a pattern full, right? Because if the overall pattern doesn't get transferred, then maybe the Tobiano will. What they might not know, however, because it has been recently discovered, is that the Tobiano pattern can hide the overall expression, and then they would end up unknowingly breeding two carriers together with the sometime tragic result we know happens. And that's why breeders, they need to be very careful. The frame overall gene is found in quarter horse, thoroughbred, paint horses, obviously, but also in miniature horses and other spotted breed that probably got their gene from the paint horses. These days, there is really no reason for this to happen and be it a surprise, really. I mean, the gene is known. There's a test for it. All you need to do is to pull some hair and send them to a genetic lab. Okay, but what about those other foals that are born white, but that don't die? Well, like I explained earlier, there's a lot of other genes that can have an impact on the distribution of the melanocyte, but that do not have an impact on the nerves of the intestines. So, it's perfectly possible, for example, for a homozygous Sabina horse to be born almost completely white, or a foal that has the dominant white gene to be born all white and be perfectly viable and healthy and go on to live a long and healthy life. 